Right. Well, we're going to turn from uh, a lot of the prayers that we've been looking at in the Old Testament to some in the New Testament. So I hope this one this morning will be a blessing to you as it is to me as we look at Paul's prayer for the church at Philippi. What a beautiful short prayer that he prays for the church there. So let's pray and we will begin our time together. If you're not in the word already, please turn to Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 we'll cover this morning. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the joy it is to meet together as sisters in Christ. Thank you for each of these ladies who are here this morning and for those who will come this evening. Thank you for the men and their ability to be able to meet as well. And we pray for Phil as he leads them, that they will have a good discussion this morning around your word and around the book they're going through. And Father, we thank you for your mercy, which has been extended to us. We thank you that we can come before your throne of grace in our time of need and pray. And Lord, I do pray that as we've been going through various prayers of the Bible, that Lord, uh, these ladies and in myself would not take this wonderful privilege for granted. And Lord, that we would pray morning, noon, and night and throughout the day that that your, um, your thoughts would be on our lips and the things that we are concerned about, we would uh, leave these at your throne. And Lord, we're just so thankful that you bend your ear to hear our prayers. So Father, uh, bless in this time, we ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, if I were to ask all of you, uh, if you desire a richer prayer life, I bet you all would say yes, right? And I do trust that as we are now in our second semester uh, looking at prayers, that I, I do pray your prayer life is richer. I pray that you've learned how to pray, uh, perhaps uh, maybe a little differently for some things. And uh, we're going to come this morning to a prayer of the Apostle Paul. And ladies, I would encourage you uh, to look at Paul's prayers and pray them in your daily prayer life because we can learn a lot from the Apostle Paul by going to school with him and learning how to pray. And the reason I say that is because most of our prayers, if you will notice, if you ever go to a prayer meeting or even in your small groups, if you will notice the prayer requests that are usually given, it's usually for what? Health. You know, I'm, I'm not feeling that well, maybe for a job, uh, maybe someone is praying for a child, they're barren and so they'd like to have a baby, uh, maybe a single gal who'd like to get married, hopefully no married woman who wants to be single, but uh, you know, could be that, I hope not. But, um, and so we, we do pray for those things and there's nothing wrong with praying those prayers. We're to pray about everything, right? So there's nothing wrong in praying for those prayers. Yet often we fail to pray for the more eternal thing, the more spiritual thing. And ladies, that's truly what's needed in our lives. For example, you might ask for prayer uh, for a certain health issue that you have, but have you ever thought that God might want to teach you something different, like the joy of suffering or patience or contentment. Uh, I remember when my husband was in the hospital and many in our church uh, prayed in the hospital parking lot for him to be healed, but God did take my husband. He did not heal him. And so through the two years I've been a widow, I have learned many things that I probably would not have learned had I not been a widow. And so maybe we are praying for healing for someone, but maybe God wants to teach us contentment or patience or trust or joy in him alone. Uh, sometimes it might be a lesson in suffering or chastening from the Lord. And so I think nothing wrong, I want to emphasize again, nothing wrong with praying mundane things. If Jesus cares about the hairs on your head, uh, he cares about those mundane things in your life. But often, ladies, we need to raise the bar a little bit and think about uh, more eternal things and more things that will be effective for the others. So let's uh, l read the prayer together, Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and uh, I'll give you an outline as soon as we read it together. Paul prays, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, in this very short prayer, we are going to see four wonderful, rich 
prayer request, and they all begin with the letter A, so hopefully you can remember to use them in your own personal prayer life. Now, just a little background about the epistle to the Philippians. Uh, the epistle to the Philippians is one of Paul's most tenderest letters. Uh, he's not, there's not a lot of theology, but there's a lot of tenderness in this letter. He had not been to the church at Philippi, been 10 to 12 years since he'd been there. And so, but this was a church that he loved dearly and they loved him dearly. And so uh, they were known for their love. They were known for their tenderness. But the epistle to the Philippians is one of the prison epistles. In other words, Paul is in prison as he's writing. And I think we need to put ourselves in his shoes as we think about this prayer because uh, Roman imprisonment was not like our prisons today. Uh, they were dark, they were dungy. He was chained to two soldiers and so he was handcuffed. Uh, also, even before he went into prison, he would have been beaten, and so he would have had these open wounds that were left untreated. A lot of the prisons were very, very cold, and so that's why Paul tells Timothy in one of his last letters, bring me a coat, I'm cold. And so also there was very little food, very little water, which is why Epaphroditus, the pastor, almost, uh, you know, he almost died trying to get this money gift to Paul because he had to walk 800 miles from Philippi to Rome. And in chapter 2 of Philippians, we see that he almost died trying to get the money there. So he's trying to get money to Paul so Paul could buy some food. Uh, there was very little of that. Uh, male and female prisoners were incarcerated together, so there was a lot of sexual immorality going on. And really, uh, they said that most prisoners would beg for a speedy death, and some of them just committed suicide. So that's how bad it was. It wasn't like our prisons today, where you can go to the canteen, you can go work out, you can have a job. And so we need to put ourselves in the writer's shoes here, Paul, as he's writing this epistle and all that is going on. And this is not the only time Paul mentions prayers. He prays this prayer for the church at Philippi. But also, if most of you uh, in here probably are very familiar with chapter 4. Some of you probably even have this memorized where Paul says, uh, we're not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses your heart will guard your mind and your heart. And he uses four Greek words for prayer there. I won't get into all that because we're not talking about that. But he does talk about prayer a lot. And you can imagine, if you were in a situation like that, I bet you'd be praying a lot, wouldn't you? <laughs> praying a lot. And so keep that in mind and keep his relationship with the church at Philippi in mind that this was a church he loved dearly and they loved him dearly and so you can imagine Paul sitting there in prison by the power of the Holy Spirit and he's writing this letter and notice how he begins and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more interesting words and this I pray in the Greek means that Paul was in the habit of continually praying he was always praying ladies I imagine if you were chained to two Roman soldiers with open bleeding wounds you'd be praying too all the time right <laughs> I, I don't think you'd be thinking about much else but prayer and it's interesting because Paul did not only pray for the church at Philippi uh, we've studied Colossians he had a prayer for the church at Colossae he prays for the church at Thessalonica he prays for the church at Rome and again I want to encourage you if you want to elevate your prayers to eternal purposes Look at the prayers in the New Testament. Use the Psalms. Uh, use Psalm 119, 176 verses. has great, uh, strong, rich things that you can pray for each other. And so, ladies, we really, I think, need to think about uh, how we are praying and uh, using some of these prayers, and especially the prayers of Paul. They will enrich your prayer life, and it will keep you focused on the eternal and the more things that are more important than the mundane things of life. And so Paul must have had quite a prayer list when you think of all the people he prayed for. Jesus himself said what? Men always ought to pray and not to faint. Paul himself said to the church at Thessalonica, we're to pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Well, you're breathing right now, right? <laughs> you're without ceasing. Don't stop breathing. Or you'll die. That's kind of what he's saying. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. And ladies, we've heard some, some prayers this year. We've, we've studied some Old and New Testament prayers. We uh, got to hear Verna last year, uh, and she taught some, and we have three more that are going to, three other ladies that are going to teach some prayers this year. So we've heard some great messages on prayer. Uh, we tell each other we'll pray for each other, right? But how much do we really pray? And uh, I want to encourage you, prayer is one of the best ways that you can show people that you love them. Um, 
often people will tell me, Susan, how, what can I do for you? Uh, what can I, is there anything I can do for you? And you know what I tell them? The best thing you can do for me is pray pray. <laughs> I need prayer. And uh, it's been humbling through the years as I've had women reach out to me and they say, I pray for you every day. Women I don't even know. And uh, they say, I pray for you every day. And I need prayer. Uh, I'm desperate in need of prayers of the saints. So what does Paul pray for them? What does he pray for them? Think of where he is. Does he pray that, hey, would you guys, you know, form a, a posse and come get me out of this place? <gasps> Do you know how bad it is here? Would you pray that I could have some good food? Uh, no, notice what he prays for them. He's not thinking of himself at all. He prays four wonderful prayers for them. And the first request, the first A is this. He prays for abounding love, abounding love. Paul puts it like this. I pray that your love will abound more and more. Now, at first you might say, Susan, that is a very strange prayer request. Didn't you just say that Paul loved the church at Philippi and the church at Philippi loved Paul? They kind of had a love relationship. Why would he ask them to pray that their love would abound more and more? Ladies, we are very fortunate, those of you that go to Grace Community Church, we are a church like that, right? One of you shaking your head. The rest of you, you need to be shaking your head. We, we are a church that loves each other, right? We love each other. We have a great relationship with our pastor. He loves us. We love him. But ladies, we have to realize if we're not careful, that love can what? Something can come in and corrupt that love. And so Paul realizes that too. Love is foundational for everything we do. Didn't Paul write 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter? Uh, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, what? I'm a big fat zero. And so, ladies, love is foundational for everything we do. And so when we're praying for abounding love and when Paul is praying for the church to have abounding love, it would be what? Love for what? Love for each other, but also for God. What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as you already do yourself, right? So, ladies, if you pray for nothing else, pray for your love to be abounding towards God and towards others. In fact, the word abound here is in the verb form of the noun abundance, and it means to have an abundance of something, something that's running over like a cup or a river that overflows. Uh, I was looking at the news and the rain that is going on right now in California, and it's crazy to see these uh, places. We lived out in California for a few years while Doug was going to seminary, but I don't ever remember seeing rain quite like that. And so uh, often water will run out of the banks of a river. It's overflowing. That's what Paul is saying. I'm praying that your love for one another will be overflowing, running out of its banks. And notice he says it should overflow in two areas. This is very important. The first area that our love should be overflowing is, according to Paul's prayer, is knowledge. What is he saying? Ladies, we should have a knowledge of the truth and a knowledge that enables us to avoid error. Think about it. Your love for one another has to be different than the love the world has to offer. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate. Some of you are Valentine's Day next week, but um, Valentine's is what? Time of you know mushy, gushy, romantic love. And that's fine. There's a place for that. But that's not what Paul's saying. He's not talking about that kind of love. Our love for each other has to be based on what? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? This book. The Word of God, right? The Word of God, which is guided by the Spirit of God. Ladies, without the Word of God, it's impossible for you, it's impossible for me to love unselfishly. Our love is very selfish. It's all about me, right? Me, 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 me. But Paul's saying, I'm praying that your love will overflow in knowledge, a discerning knowledge of love that is guided by the Holy Spirit. Not only should our love abound in knowledge, but notice what he says next. It should also abound in discernment. The word here means the power of discernment. And what Paul is saying, I want your love to be exercised 
with proper discrimination. Oh, ladies, we need this. Uh, I meet many women that are caught up in the false teachers of our day. We need discernment. Christian love is not blind. It is not blind. So we don't believe everything that comes down the pike. Ladies, we must be discerning in our love. We should love discernment. And what is Paul saying as he's praying this prayer? I want you to grow in discernment. Be discerning in your love. Be discerning in your love. I meet women all the time, and they say, well, there's nothing wrong with this, nothing wrong with that. And I do. I read this person. I, I said, you need to be discerning. Discerning in your love. Um, and ladies, we need this. In John MacArthur's book, by the way, if you've never read this, this is one of his older ones, but in my humble opinion, one of his best ones, is called Reckless Faith, When the Church Loses the Will to Discern. Reckless Faith, When the Church Loses the Will to Discern. Uh, again, I highly recommend it. But he, he says, if we're going to be discerning people, in other words, love with discernment, we must develop the skill of discriminating between truth and error. And then he gives a biblical formula for how to be discerning in your love. And I want to give you these. They're very short. Number one, we must judge everything, examine everything. Ladies, be like the Bereans who search daily to see. You should be checking me out. You should make sure the things I'm teaching are truth. Uh, your pastor, whoever that is, you need to be checking it out. So judge everything. Number two, once you've heard the message, cling to what is good, but get away from what is evil. Cling to what's good, but get away from what is evil. Next, he says, you should pray for discernment. Ladies, when you're, when you're listening to a Bible teacher or a YouTube or something like that, and someone's saying, hey, what do you think about this person? Or you should listen to this YouTube. Do you, do you ask the Lord, give me discernment as I'm, I'm listening to this or as I'm reading this? Uh, I just got finished reading a book uh, on the plane. I didn't get to read all of it, but skimmed enough of it. And uh, it wasn't that it was bad, but it wasn't the best. And uh, I gave it to Debbie this morning. I said, find someone that wants it. It's not heretical, but it's just not the best book on the topic. And so we just need to be discerning as we're reading and as we're listening to people. Next, he says, desire wisdom. Desire wisdom. Next, he says, obey the truth. So once you know that this is true, what is being said, what is being read, what you're learning, he says, obey it. Next, he says, follow discerning leaders. Follow discerning leaders. Next, depend on the Holy Spirit. And last, study the scriptures. So judge everything, cling to what's good, avoid what's evil, desire wisdom, pray for discernment, obey the truth, follow discerning leaders, depend on the Holy Spirit, and study the scriptures. Ladies, we need to be discerning. Be discerning in your love. And by the way, this would include the friends you choose to hang around with. The Bible says a wise man chooses his friends carefully. And so I would encourage you, choose your girlfriends, your women friends, based on on those who love the Lord and are discerning women, uh, women who have godly wisdom. Be very careful about the women you hang out with. And Paul knew the Philippi, the church at Philippi needed discernment. They needed to grow, their love needed to abound in knowledge. Yes, knowledge of the truth, but also discernment. Well, let's move on to verse 2 and the second and the third prayer request for the church at Philippi. The second prayer, Paul prays for them. He says, I pray that you will approve the things that are excellent. So the second prayer request is approval of excellent things. Approval of excellent things. The word approve here means um, a testing of metals to discern their quality, to see if they're true or not. But ladies, before we can approve things that are excellent, we must be able to distinguish between what is excellent and what is not. Now, Paul's not saying, listen up, he's not saying you discern between right and wrong. That's not what he's praying for them. He's praying for the church at Philippi that they will choose the most excellent thing to do, the highest, the thing that is the worthwhile, the most valuable for their time. So ladies, this involves thinking. I know for me, I'm a list maker. I have a list right now in my planner of things I need to do today. And, uh, you know, I look at that list often and I say, okay, Susan, what's the most eternal thing or things on your list today? 
And that's what I do first. Uh, because that other stuff, you know, balancing your checkbook and all that, that'll get done, you know, or making the phone calls I need to make. And that's what that Paul is saying here. I'm praying that you'll choose things that are excellent. Think biblically. Focus your time and your energy on what really counts. And ladies, the only way you are going to discern how to prove what is excellent is to know what the scriptures say. And what does God say is the most excellent thing for you to be doing as a woman? We have passages full uh, for us as women on things we should be doing. You cannot make choices to please others or you'll end up in trouble. You cannot be controlled by your emotions, your moods, your circumstances. You've got to be sober-minded. So how can I make excellent choices? How can I choose for my day the things that are most excellent? I want to give you seven questions to ask yourself when facing a decision on what is best. By the way, these are not mine, but they were given by a godly man in my husband's second church in a Sunday school class, and I thought they were so good, I wrote them down. So how to choose the things that are most excellent. Number one, is this something that will enslave me? Is this something that will enslave me? If it will, you probably shouldn't do it. Ladies, I meet a lot of women that are addicted to social media. They now say 46% of all children are addicted to social media. I just saw that statistic. But women are too. Uh, a lot of Christian women get caught up in social media, spend four or six hours a day, but will not spend five minutes face-to-face -face with God in his word and scripture. So ladies, if you have an addiction to that, I would encourage you, you might want to put that away. Is this something that will enslave you? Number two, is this something that will create an appetite for more? Is this something that will create an appetite for more? If so, you might need to put it away. I like what John MacArthur says, others may, I may not. So it may not be a wrong thing, but if it creates appetite for more to where it's keeping you from doing what is best eternally, you might want to put it away. Number three, is this something that will destroy my ability to think logically? Is this something that will destroy my ability to think logically? The amount of people today that are on psychotropic drugs is crazy. I can't even keep up with the statistics. And so it is destroying our ability to think logically. Number four, this thing that I want to do today, is this something that will weaken my intimacy with God? Is it something that's going to weaken my intimacy with God? Which really leads to the next one. Will it cause you to neglect Bible study and prayer? Ladies, if anything in your life today is causing you to neglect time in the word and prayer, you need to put it away put it away. <laughs> it's not worth it, right? Uh, we're to be studying to show ourselves approved to God. Number six, will it cause my body to rule over my spirit and my soul? Will this thing cause my body to rule over my spirit and my soul? And then last but not least, and this is probably, you might say, well, why didn't you just give us this one and leave the other six out? Can you ask God to bless this? This thing you're getting ready to do this person you're getting ready to meet with, this whatever activity you're getting ready to participate in, ladies, if you can't bow your head and say, Lord, please bless what I'm getting ready to do, you probably shouldn't do it, right? Probably shouldn't do it. So uh, that's a, a good clincher. Can I ask God to bless this? Well, Paul is praying for them that they would choose the most excellent things. Ladies, the things that count for eternity. And I think that is a great prayer request to pray for me. I hope you pray that for me, but also for yourself. Lord, help me today to choose the things that are most excellent. Ladies, every one of us one day is going to stand before the Lord and give an account for everything we've done in our body, whether it's good or bad. And so we want to be able to stand before him unashamed. Well, notice Paul's third request. It's for authentic living, authentic living. Paul puts it like this. He said, I pray that you'll be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. You'll be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The word sincere comes from two words which mean without wax. Now that might get what you're saying, what? Without wax? Well, in the biblical world, 
when a furniture dealer was selling furniture, oftentimes, you might want to look at my hands, but oftentimes a piece of furniture would have, uh, you know, p places here that were missing. And so he would get some wax, the same color as the furniture, and he would fill it in. So when a buyer came in to his store to buy this piece of furniture, the buyer would say, is this piece of furniture without wax? And if the dealer was honest, he would tell them, it, you know, I'm sorry, it's not without wax. But if it really was without wax, he'd say, yes, it was without wax. But if the buyer had questioned the seller's integrity, he would say, let's hold, you know, hold it up to the light so I can see if it w is without wax. Ladies, this is what Paul is praying. He says, as we expose ourselves to the light of God's word, we should be women without wax. We should be who we really are, right? We should be women who are transparent in our character. Ladies, our heart on the inside should be what we are on the outside. We should not be women who are hypocrites or whose secret sins show up when we're under pressure or trials. Um, just recently, it's been illustrated to me of someone I know that's going through some tremendous trials, and they're proving who they really are by the way they're facing their trials. And so this is even when there's pressure, we still stay the course. We still love the Lord. We still love his people. people. The opposite would be a hypocrite. This is someone who is not what they appear to be, one man said, this implies this person's truly converted. He has not assumed Christianity as a mask. His motives are pure. His conduct is free from double dealing, trick, and cunning. His words express the real sentiments of his heart. He's true to his word and faithful to his promises. And he always professes what he professes he is. I like what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are is at home is what you are. And so this person is the same at home as they are at church. So Paul says, I'm praying that you'll be without offense. The word offense here means to be blameless, and it refers to not causing others to stumble. This is authentic living. In fact, the original word was used to describe the part of a trap to which a bait was attached, which would cause someone to trip into the trap. What is Paul saying? I'm praying that you'll be sincere without wax and without offense. Don't cause someone else to stumble by your behavior. Don't do it. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore, let us not judge any mother anymore, but rather this. Don't put a stumbling block to cause your brother to stumble. Remember what Jesus said? He says, Anyone who causes one of these little ones to stumble, it were better for him that a millstone be hung around his neck and he be cast into the depths of the sea. Ladies, causing a brother or sister to stumble is a very serious sin, and we are seeing this a lot today. It's alarming to me, uh, and we've talked about this before, but this has been just recently illustrated in the last two weeks, another good man uh, that many of you probably follow. He's causing people to stumble by a decision, by something he said. And, and ladies, it's so important that as we walk our Christian life, we don't cause other people to stumble by the foolish choices we make or the things that we do or the things that we say. And so Paul says, I'm praying that you'll have authentic living. Be sincere. Be who you really are, but don't cause people to stumble by your behavior, by your actions, by your words. So how long does Paul pray that they would be sincere and without offense? Well, how long do you think you need to be sincere and without offense? <laughs> Till the day of Christ. That's what he says, right? Till the day of Christ. Ladies, our whole life must be in preparation for that day when we're going to see him. We're going to see him face to face, and then you're not going to be able to hide who you really are. He's going to see you as you are. He sees you now as you are. And ladies, that day we are going to be revealed. So maybe two more good questions to ask ourselves when trying to figure out those gray areas in our life would be this. What I'm getting ready to do, will it make others stumble? And would I be ashamed if Jesus should return? Those are good questions to ask. Well, we now come to the final prayer request for the church at Philippi found in verse 11. The fourth request is for abundance of fruit bearing. Abundance of fruit bearing. 
Paul prays this. He says, I'll pray that you are filled with the fruits of righteousness, abundance of fruit bearing. You might say, well, what is this fruits of righteousness? Well, fruits of righteousness is an expression taken from the Old Testament. Proverbs 1130 talks about the fruit of righteousness, which is a tree of life. And ladies, the only way we can produce fruits of righteousness is to be rightly related to God, right? You can't produce fruit unless you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, I want you to bear fruits of righteousness. Now, I want to stop here and talk a little bit about fruit, uh, because often we think of fruit as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control. And yes, those should be in all of our lives. Um, those things should be present in our lives. But you know that fruit is mentioned 106 times in the Bible, different kinds of fruit. There's all kinds of fruit. And we know fruit can only be produced by God's children. Uh, that's the only way that it, they, are, they are the only ones that can produce. You have to have a right relationship with him. In fact, if you're not fruitful, that's an indication you're either uh, walking in disobedience or you may be an unbeliever, as seen in the parable of the soils. And ladies, bearing fruit is not something you can produce on your own. Uh, you can only do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to mention some of the kinds of fruit. Since we are to be praying for one another, that we will be filled with fruits of righteousness, what would be some of those fruits? Well, Proverbs talks about the fruit of our mouth. <laughs> the fruit of our mouth. So think about it. What kind of fruit comes out of your mouth? Murmuring, complaining, kind words, sharp words, praise. So think about what we say. Uh, I like someone said, you know, taste your words before you speak them, you know. Uh, so life and death are in the power of the tongue. Secondly, another one, the fruit of the hands. Remember the Proverbs 31 woman? It talks about the fruit of her hands. Have you ever wondered about that? Your hands? What do your hands do? What do your hands do during the day? Is it fruitful? What do you do with your hands? Are you wasting God's valuable time with your hands? Another one, Isaiah 57, 19, talks about the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. Again, that would be our mouth. Here's one we don't think about much. Jeremiah 6, 19 talks about the fruit of our thoughts. Ooh, that's an area that no one sees but you and God. However, Google now, I don't know if you saw that, but uh, they've planted a chip now in somebody's brain that knows what's going on. And, uh, but I read in that same article that Google now has the ability to know what you're even thinking. And it's very strange because I've noticed it in my life. Maybe some of you have noticed. I'll be thinking something, haven't told anybody what I'm thinking, and all of a sudden I get an ad for that or something. And so that's kind of creepy. My daughter and I were talking about that while she was here. She goes, Mom, it happens to me all the time. I was like, me too. It's kind of creepy. Uh, I know God knows our thoughts, and it's kind of creepy that what the kind of technology that we're having now. But, ladies, what, what goes through your mind? What kind of thoughts do you have? And when you have a thought that comes into your mind and it, you know it's not godly, do you ask the Lord to help you? And again, that's why I want to encourage you to memorize scripture <laughs> because that will help you change the way you think. But what occupies your mind most of the time? Do you dwell on things above, earthly things, heavenly things? What kind of things do you feed your mind? Remember, garbage in, garbage out. So if you're feeding your mind the lies of this world, uh, that's what's going to come out in your thought life. Again, feed on scripture. Uh, that's what should be going through our minds. Another one is the fruit of our doings. The fruit of our doings. Jeremiah 17, 10 talks about the fruit of our doings. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? What's a typical day for you? Is it honoring to the Lord? Is he pleased? Are you investing your life in others? I mean, we could go on. Paul talks about the fruit of the brethren, which is the gospel. Are you sharing the gospel with people? That's the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Is there anyone being brought to a knowledge of the gospel by your testimony? And, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. And we could go on and on. One I really like is fruit in old age, especially since I'll be a year older on Friday. Like, okay, Lord, help me to bear fruit in my old age. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'd rather go out in a blaze of glory, right? And, and I think I've shared this before, but my daughter says, Mom, why do old people quit serving and quit? They're not passionate for the Lord anymore. And this should be our best year, shouldn't they? 
Our older years should be our best years, and so fruit in our old age. There's also fruit with patience, fruit unto holiness, all this. I, again, 106 times it's mentioned. Do a word study on fruit sometime. It's amazing. So what's the purpose of all this fruit? Notice what Paul says. It's for his glory and his praise. It's all for him, ladies. It's not for us. Paul's prayer closes with a reminder that all these requests, these four prayer requests, are not for them, but for the glory and praise of God. It's all for him. You know, many times we pray. I know I end a lot of my prayers, and Lord, whatever we do, may it all be done for your glory. May we glorify you. But ladies, what are we praying when we say that? We can't add to his glory, right? How can you and I, who are dust, bring glory and praise to God? We can't add to his glory. Well, think about it. Think about these four prayer requests alone. When others see fruits of righteousness on display in your life, they have a better picture of what God's like, right? And that brings glory and praise to God. When you're using your spiritual gifts for his glory, it brings praise and glory to him. When they see you loving others abundantly, that glorifies God. The love that goes on in this body, I don't know how many visitors come say, I've never seen a church like this, that loves one another, that cares for one another. That doesn't put us on display, it puts who? God on display. Thirdly, we glorify God when we increase in knowledge and discernment. And lastly, we put God on display, we glorify him when we make excellent choices with our time, right? Being sincere and without offense is another way to glorify our Lord. Ladies, that's why it's so important for you and I to conduct our life in a way that will bring honor and glory to him. As a songwriter said years ago, it's not a song we hear sung anymore, but I thought it was a very pointed song at the time I heard it. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. Do you ever remember that song? You're the only Jesus some will ever see. So my question to you this morning is, if others' knowledge of the Lord Jesus was your life only, what would Jesus' character be like to them? If they were watching you, and especially these four prayer requests, what would Jesus look like to them if you were the only Jesus they ever saw? Well, what wonderful prayers we can pray for each other, abounding love, approval of excellent things, authentic living, and abundance of fruit bearing. You can pray this for me anytime you want. <laughs> so what about your prayers? Are you praying for abundance, abundant, excuse me, abounding in love or abounding in money? Are you praying for approval of excellent things or approval of man? Are you praying for authentic living or some authentic weight loss? Are you praying for an abundance of fruit bearing or an abundance of relaxation? In closing, I would like to quote from something from Elizabeth Elliot because it really goes with what Paul is praying here. She says this, because I am of the earth, I find my prayers for the people I love are mostly bound by very earthly concerns. Lord, would you help P to find a good wife? Show G which college to attend? Provide money for W's house and E's car? Help T with his book and give X a better job. She says it's proper to pray for these things, but there are prayers of far more and lasting importance, which we must also learn to pray. We can find words for those in the prayer of Jesus for the people he loved. He prays that they may be one, that they might find his joy complete in themselves, that they will be kept from evil, that they will be made holy by the truth, that they will live in Christ, they'll grow into one, that they might be with him, and that the love which God has for Christ would be in their hearts. She says this, if we learn to pray those kinds of prayers, it will perhaps amend the lesser prayers. Lord, teach me to pray, she says. Open my eyes to see beyond the earthly to the heavenly. Let my primary concerns be heavenly ones, that your kingdom may come on earth and your will be done in me and in those I love. Teach me to pray with Jesus for his sake. Our Father, we do want to ask that you would help us to not only think through these prayer requests because they have some very pointed meanings for our lives personally, 
But Lord, it would be my desire that the ladies in this room, that their love would abound yet more and more in knowledge and judgment, that they would approve things that are excellent, that they would be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, and they would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Oh, God, may you help us to live this out. And I know this prayer is not just for the church at Philippi. It's for the church universal. Lord, we need men and women like this today that are living out this prayer that Paul prays there in prison. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. Bless in the groups. Bless the ladies as they lead. And for those who cannot be here this morning, we pray you're, you would uh, encourage them or comfort or whatever it is that they need this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.